So I, I began this research in the mid-2000s. I didn't formally begin to write a book until a few years after that, but I began to notice in the Japan-China relationship, and especially from the Japanese side, which is my specialty, I couldn't tell you uh, about Chinese politics, and many of the others here could, but I could sense inside Japan, there were two kind of senses of trepidation about this new and rising China. And remember, the vocabulary we were using in the mid-2000s wasn't quite the rising China. We hadn't quite gotten our minds around this notion that we were in the, middle, the midst of, of tremendous geostrategic change. We were still talking about China's emergence and, and various and sundry ways to engage, but we really, really weren't having the narrative or the, the, the focal point that we're having today. So I didn't start out writing about a rising China. But I did want to, to get a better feel for why Japan and China were increasingly having difficulty solving problems together. And for those of you who've watched the relationship over the last several decades, four decades or more now, since the peace treaty in 1978, there's always been tensions in this relationship. This is not new. The history issues, war memory, Yasukuni Shrine, we've, we've been here before. Um, but there are newer issues that were coming to the fore in the 2000s. There were trade disputes over shiitake and tatami. Uh, there were new ways of thinking about the East China Sea. Uh, as you got further into that decade, you began to have some more, more crisis-type scenarios, like the gyoza mondai, as the Japanese call it, the moment at which poison dumplings were imported from Japan. And the Japanese public was really quite shocked at the level of economic interdependence they were seeing between Japan and China. Um, and then, of course, by the end of the decade, we get this very um, obvious and um, dramatic shift away from a bilaterally managed territorial dispute to a territorial dispute that by, the, by 2012, 2013, people really thought, and I can tell you for sure in Washington, people really thought that there was a real danger here, that the two countries may inadvertently, not deliberately, but may inadvertently find themselves exchanging some kind of military force. So the evolution of the book, um, the way I went about the book at the beginning was not really to talk about China's rise and Japanese domestic politics, but really to get a better feel for what it was the Japanese policymakers were trying to grapple with. Why was it harder? And so in the end, I ended up focusing, I took a, a pretty straightforward case study methodology by the time I sat down to write, and I wanted to focus on these issues of contention. Not because there's not a whole host of issues that the Japanese and Chinese governments and peoples uh, can't cooperate on. They do. They have a tremendously uh, deep economic interdependence. $345 billion a year worth of economic interdependence. Great citizen-to-citizen -citizen exchange program and sister cities and all of that. There's a cooperative relationship there that clearly um, um, is the foundation of that relationship. But the political management of the, pro the problems is what I wanted to focus on. So I highlight four cases of contention. And I picked the four partly because they were a little bit in the headlines and I could get at some of the, the, the politics, but I also wanted to look at, get a different, slightly different case study. So I started off with the, the, the obvious one, which is, I call it the Imperial War Veterans, but it's really, it's a Yasukuni chapter, right? Um, I also wanted to talk about the maritime boundary between Japan and China, largely because I think a lot of people collapse it with the island dispute. It, in fact, is a different problem for them. And it became a problem not because of antipathy between Japanese and Chinese, but it became more of a problem because of the UN law of the sea. Both ratified it, both understood that they would have to negotiate through its premises, their uh, extended economic zone, right? They're easy. Um, but, but that was not a problem they ever had before. They managed to share the East China Sea up until the 1990s actually quite, quite well despite the differences over the islands, right? Now they negotiated around that problem, but they didn't have difficulty until you start seeing this new regime emerge. And then the two positions of the two countries on that regime were, were not able to be uh, negotiated. Beyond that, you, you, this, I mentioned the, the gyoza mondai, um, but there's a chapter on food safety and food security. And we don't think about it very often as a high politics issue. We don't think about it very often as being a, a, dip, a source of diplomatic contention. But as we've witnessed over the last decade and a half, inside Japan as well as inside China, there's a great deal of a conversation about food safety, about what kind of regulatory apparatus you need. Uh, and I will tell you, for those of you who don't know Japan, many of you in the room do, um, but if you don't know Japan, for most of us who go and live there, we are completely uh, persuaded that the Japanese have the highest level of food safety in the 
Why? Because the Japanese themselves are persuaded <laughs> that they have the <laughs> highest level of food safety in the world. Um, and so if you, if you live in a Japanese apartment and you have a family, you undoubtedly will get your food through a co-op. They will deliver it right to your door. Uh, and they'll deliver it from the farmers around the country. And it'll be, it, it will presume to look like it was originated in Japan. This is Japanese food. Yamagata, wherever. Um, but in fact, a larger and larger percentage of Japanese food was not. Uh, made in Japan, it was made and processed in China. And in fact, even that co-op that delivers it to your doorstep, to your family, is importing processed food from China. So the expansion of Japanese companies into China, and the production of food in China through joint ventures with Chinese as well as Taiwanese and other firms, brought a whole new phase of regulatory challenge to the Japanese and Chinese. Um, I'll tell you more about that if you're interested later on. And then the final, let, let me touch on the final issue of contention, which everybody in this room probably knows more about um, than they'd like to, which is the Senkaku, the Aoyu Island dispute, and how that, the critical moments in 2010 and again in 2012, uh, when the two governments really went outside their bilateral framework, the framework they had developed in uh, 1978 to try to manage those differences over sovereignty, that disappeared in 2010. Um, Partly because of Japanese domestic politics, <clears throat> partly because the issue itself was very hard to manage uh, outside it, because the relationship had gotten very stormy, but also because clearly for the Japanese it became an issue of, a lot of the US-Japan alliance. It couldn't handle that issue alone anymore. So in the last chapter, the last case study I look at, I look at island defenses or the defense of Japan and the debate inside Japan over what Japan now needs in, in the face of this new and rising China and if and how it needs to use the alliance more effectively, if and how it needs to think about its maritime security in the face of a China that now wants to have and, and has global maritime interests. So that last chapter is really about pretty traditional defense issues, but I examine a little bit how those two crises over the islands inform Japanese strategic planners. So those are the four case studies. The bottom line is, Again, you hear a lot in the headlines, as Steve said, you, you get the kind of glossy, <laughs> Japan is turning to the right, Mr. Abe is conservative, right? You, you get that headline, and I think the, there's a lot of that kind of advocacy also at, at play inside Japan and outside Japan. But what I found in these four case studies over time is that depending on the policy issue, you had a very different constellation of Japanese domestic interests. You didn't get, and I expected to get more of this, especially in the two chapters that you would expect slightly more conservative nationalist uh, uh, coalitions to be forming, in other words, on Yasuni and on the islands themselves, or national defense, you didn't really get the building of policy coalitions that were distinctly anti-China or were distinctly nationalist. Do you get more nationalists and more advocates for a strong Senkaku defense? Absolutely. So you get some issue-based nationalisms, some issue-based advocacy. And China is the boogeyman uh, when you look at Yasukuni Shrine or you look at the, at the um, island case. But you don't see that weaving across the political spectrum in Japan. You don't see social movement activity for those of you who are academics. And that was interesting to me. The second piece that I thought was very interesting was that what you got at the domestic level was perhaps there were folks out there who were anti-China, had always been, Ishihara Shinto easily comes to mind, right? But what you get in, in each of these policy areas, in fact, is a greater advocacy by these interests, interest groups for Japanese policy change or even institutional change. So at the end of the day, my four cases didn't add up to an anti-China nationalism, but they did add up to a fairly straightforward complaint about the Japanese government's ability to manage this rise in China. That may be a subtle difference, but it's an important one, I think, as we think about this relationship going forward. It doesn't redound in a Japan that wants to confront China. There's a little bit of atmospherics over standing up and advocating Japanese interests, but in large part, the complaints were really directed at the Japanese government itself for, for being ineffectual, for being unresponsive, for lacking the kinds of protections, for example, in food safety, consumer protections that many other societies had. So it highlighted in many ways Japan's liabilities, Japan's weaknesses. And I think at the end of the book, it made me realize that, yes, could we see an anti-China-based nationalism emerge? Possibly, but it's not, we're not there yet. What we have is a Japan that's incrementally adjusting, trying to cope. 
the place where I worry the most is that Japanese policymakers don't think that they can manage their problems bilaterally with China anymore. And that, I think, is the real loss, if, there's, if we're going to talk about a loss. There is, I think, the huge challenge for policymakers, not only in Tokyo, but also in Beijing, and clearly also in Washington as well. So we see in the last six months or so, we see Xi Jinping uh, and Mr. Abe finally get to that meeting. You see the gears of government start to turn again. They had another meeting at Bandung. Clearly, the, the, the body language, the facial expressions were slightly better. They, they weren't warm and fuzzy by any means, but they were certainly better than they were at the APEC meeting. Um, but what you're getting now is the back to the regular churning of government to government dialogue. I think you've made some progress on the maritime talks. You now have, if not confidence building measures, you at least have a dialogue ongoing about perhaps developing those confidence building measures, including a conversation, which I think is very important, between the two Coast Guards. Right? Um, I can go on more in, in detail about specifics, but maybe at this, end, at this end would be a good time for me to take a break, Steve? And sure. We can come back and use maps or whatever we need to do, but thank you all for being so patient. No, thank you. I mean, one of the great things about the book is, is you know, you, for instance, the, 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 the fishing trawler incident. You know, I've always wondered, I, people say, ah, oh, you know, the Japanese behave differently, and this was it. So Sheila, in the book, lists every single incursion that has occurred and talks about how the Japanese dealt with it. So I guess my question, one of my first question is, the, the um, you know, the, the, the DPJ was in power. If the LDP had been in power, would we have had a different result and the captain would have just been released and we wouldn't have had this explosion? Getting to exactly your point that it just was, it wasn't anti-China, it was just mismanagement. I think, you know, it's, it's hard to sort of turn back the clock and rewrite it and see whether that's true or not. I, I think probably, to be honest with you, um, I think it may have depended on which LDP member was in power, right? Um, the man, but I think what I was trying to show in the book is over time, you can see that there's greater activism uh, by Japanese, by Taiwanese, by Hong Kong based activists, and that the two governments, Chinese and Japanese governments, on this territorial issue um, had basically agreed to, if not set it aside, they'd agreed to not let it get in the way of the broader relationship, right? But the activisms kept multiplying. And when the activisms got more and more conspicuous, then the governments felt they had to respond. So Koizumi uh, actually began to rent those islands from the private owner who had maintained access to them, right? And remember, some of these activists on the Japanese side, again, the details are in the book, but some of the Japanese activists actually went through the owners to try to advocate their position on building a lighthouse, doing something different. But the Japanese government never really really bought into that until 2000, 2001, when it was becoming clear that the two governments weren't going to be able to contain the activism and prevent incidents from happening and erupting. And so Koizumi began a quiet conversation with the owners to rent the islands, which he did uh, at that time. So we, we see the, the highlight of 2012 and Prime Minister Noda purchasing the islands, and that produced huge uh, outpouring of criticism in China. But the Japanese government ostensibly had already had physical control over those islands since it, it, it had rented them a decade or so earlier. But I think that the basic, the co conventional wisdom, Steve, in Japan is that the DPJ blew it. Yeah. They blew it by arresting him. They blew, they blew it actually by detaining him uh, and trying to prosecute the captain under domestic law. Fishermen have been arrested in the past. Right? They've been detained even, but they've always been quietly then turned over to Chinese authorities. Um, and in this case, they didn't. They said they were going to prosecute him fully under Japanese law. And there was seemed to be, when I read the media at that time, there seemed to be some sense that this was a Chinese government activity. But there was no evidence, nor did your book suggest there was any evidence, that this was anything but maybe a drunk captain who was fishing where probably his grandfather fished. <coughs> It's interesting that if you look at the, and I, I expected to go back and look at the numbers, and again, there, there may be other numbers that are available in the Chinese record that I can't get access to. So I, again, I'm looking at Japanese statistical data by the Coast Guard, by the fisheries agencies and others. Um, and in large part, you don't get a lot of Chinese PRC fishermen in and around the Senkakus. They don't fish that far away from home, although they're beginning to now. So I think you're beginning to see an expansion 
in the, in the reach of the Chinese fishermen themselves, right? But it's not as if he was he he, he, was, he had always been fishing in, in around those islands, right? He may have thought it was his right to do so, but it's not necessarily clear. Most of the Okinawan fishermen and most of the Okinawan registry information really were Taiwanese fishermen. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the those islands were largely populated by Japanese, but even more so by Taiwanese fishing boats, because the Taiwanese themselves had been. And that, they, and they is, regularly right. returned these Taiwanese to Taiwan right. after they were caught right. violating the law. If was, they were, yes, yeah. So the incident the, it itself, and again, this is not to, to rationalize it or to excuse it or anything else, but the incident that happened, the, the one piece that was different than in the past was that he rammed two uh, Japanese Coast Guard ships. Right. So by all, by all accounts, he, he was drunk. Um, I think that's apparently. I think we can accept that fact because he seemed to be inebriated even under detention. Um, so he had a few. Whether that was the causal factor or not, I can't say. Um, but he did <coughs> deliberately ram the two Coast Guard ships, and that was a interaction between the Coast Guard and um, others around those islands that had not happened in the past. So you had activists, people jumping overboard to swim ashore. You had people with megaphones yelling, and, you know, all kinds of things, but right. you've not had that kind of physical encounter um, in the past. And those islands are far away. I mean, one of the, can I show one map? I mean, everybody here probably sees this map all the time. Let me see if I can do this and get where I need to go. So this is, I mean, I, I think you guys have it everywhere. It's lovely. <laughs> we had this at the council, so lovely. It's so beautiful. Um, so I think there's two things to remember here. One is just how distant, I think I have another map. I'll try and figure out. So there you have it. Um, yep. They're far away. And again, I went out to Ishigaki Island to interview the fishermen. And it's the Ishigaki fishermen from the Japanese side that, are, that tend to be out fishing around there. You'll see from northern Taiwan, right? Uh, they're not quite equidistant, but almost. But if you want to go from the Chinese coast or from the main island of Okinawa, where Naha is on that map, that's a very long stretch of water to go if you're a fisherman. Um, maybe not if you're a government ship, right? Or a Coast Guard right. ship or a larger ship. But if you're a, the fishermen in the East China Sea are not normally huge trawlers. They're very they're much smaller ships. And therefore it takes a long time to get out there. And there's no ports, no place to go. So the, and the waters are very rough. Mm -hmm. Now, you said we, 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 we've moved on to the Biao Um You say, I'm quoting from the book, national purchase became the only way of forestalling conservative calls for a more assertive defense of Japanese sovereignty over the islands. I don't agree with that conclusion. There were a dozen kind of structures that you could have put in place that would have not cross the bright red line that China had, had drawn. That the consequences that were clear to the US government, were clear to the Japanese government, and were clear to the Chinese government. And yet, this decision to go ahead with the purchase was made when it wasn't that complicated. You could have structured a lot of ways where it wasn't a purchase and didn't cross that red line. So the so, only way? Is that your conclusion, or are you just? So, if you're looking at it from outside, it may it may appear there are a lot of it's options. A political right? judgment. It was the and, and so what I'm in, in the book is what I was looking at is the political dynamics inside Tokyo at the time. Um, Governor Ishihara had taken the trouble to come all the way to Tokyo, uh, to Washington D.C. to give a speech at the Hudson in Institute, right? Um, not the Hudson. I'm sorry, the Heritage Foundation, right. um, in which he said, "I'm going to defend those islands," right? Now, I'll tell you, because I was in Washington at the time, as were many Japanese reporters, and they were like, oh my god, here he goes again. Because yeah, he's been making right. statements about the Senkakus his entire career, right? And I'm not saying this to make fun of, of Mr. Ishihara. It's simply, what is he talking about? There was a little bit of puzzlement, right? Um, but he was very carefully laying some ground, groundwork. Um, and it turned out, within months, he already had, I mean, he had engaged in a certain amount of what the Japanese call nimawashi, but discussions behind the scenes with the Kante, the Prime Minister's office at the time. And basically, this is the fallout from that 2010 Chinese fishing crisis um, that I write about in the book. Now, I'm not saying this was the wisest choice of the government, so don't misunderstand me. And I think you and I are maybe using the same language to say different things. but. But the Ishihara was pretty intent on the purchase. He had already made contact with the family, the Kuriharas. Now the Kuriharas, I couldn't interview. I tried, 
Uh, they have a lawyer. They will go nowhere near you, especially me. But they wouldn't go near the press. They, they were completely silent on this. So I can't, this is conjecture. Um, but what he ended up telling the Conte at the time was that the family needed the money, and the family did not want to be in the middle of this big dispute. They wanted to opt out. Um, and so he was quite willing, as the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, to purchase the islands. In other words, they would be held by the Tokyo Metropolitan Government, and they would be used for amusement parks. He had all kinds of ideas, right? Um, the vulnerability of Prime Minister Noda is one of the reasons that, that I say I don't think he had much choice. Mm -hmm. So um, it was his, it was his it was, weakness. Yeah, it was the that weakness of the gave him no option. The, but to just, the DPJ government, right. right? And in the end, they felt that they were. You know, you can talk to Aki Nagashima, who was the advisor to Noda. You can talk to just about anybody who was involved in it at the time. They really felt like their back was up against the wall. It was going right. to be the national government of Japan that did this, or it was going to be Mr. Ishihara. And the one piece of the puzzle that made that political calculus very clear, because it wasn't, I think, until this happened, is, of course, the, the, the Tokyo Assembly, like any city assembly, said to the governor, I'm sorry, but why are you spending our taxpayer money on your pet dream of buying these islands, right? And of course, the, the assembly members were on TV speaking to reporters saying, no, thank you. Uh, it's not our money that needs to do that. And so he began to, to, to ask for donations. So he publicly asked for the, the, the fund funds that would come in, that they called it the Senkaku Fund, and within a week or two, he had millions, millions of dollars worth of donations across the country. So that, I think, was the penny that dropped in terms of the, of the central government's calculus about there's popular support for this, he's getting support from beyond you know, his own constituency of Tokyo Metropolitan, and in fact, there was a lot of whispering that there may be support by other political parties as well. So, Right or wrong answer, yeah. it was not a moment for creative diplomacy. It was rather a moment to say, let's stop this before it gets out of hand. Because once the private property changed hands, there was nothing the central government could have done to take it but, at that point. And right? should the US have done more? I guess the question should be two parts. Could and should the US have done more mm -hmm. to stop it? I, you know, again, we, you will have to invite Kurt Campbell. Because I saw Kirk giving a, a talk once after everything had happened, and he said that he had given the red line to Tokyo. You know, you used the red line frame, phrase. I don't sense if there were red lines that they were communicated very clearly or that they were perceived very clearly. Let's put it that way. Whether it's a red line by Beijing or it was a red line by the United States. So they may have been delivered quite clearly, um, but I'm not sure that the, the, the antenna were up or that they just weren't as clear as they needed or to Or they be. didn't want to hear. Because they, 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 politically, yeah. exactly what you said, that yeah. political analysis, yeah. if I recognize it's a red line and know that we're crossing yeah. it, then it's going to make it more difficult for me to deal yeah. with the local politics. Again, I, I think we should have reined in the Japanese. I think the consequences of this continue to resonate today. Um, let, me, let me go on to one of the other great parts of the book, which is your, your discussion of Yasukuni. Again, what the beauty of it, it's something that there's so much, so much, there's so little is kind of driven by fact. And, and Sheila lays out just, you know, the history of this. And it's just, it's great because I don't, you know, I visited Yasukuni and was deeply, deeply, deeply offended. I mean, I, you know, I think if, if, if there were a documentary on Yasukuni that was shown to the American people, they the American people would have called the Congress and say, do not allow this prime minister to address a joint session. I think it is so deeply offensive. And as an American, not a as an American I mean, forget, that, but partly, you know, as a Chinese or Korean, even, even more. Um, and you talk about, the, you know, the, the enshrinement not occurring until 1978, which... Interesting coincidence. You know, one... <laughs> Many didn't know. Um, the emperor doesn't go. Why? The Japanese emperor, Emperor Hirohito, stopped going after the 14 Class A uh, war criminals were um, entered. Into oh, what, what, is, what is it? It's a crime. They were convicted of crimes against humanity? They were convicted under the Tokyo, the, the United States and the, and, and the Allies, the United States and the Allies, after World War II, conducted two sets of war criminal tribunals. One was Nuremberg. Uh, with the Germans, and the other was Tokyo War Tribunal in uh, Sugama, in Tokyo. Um, 
I, got, I did a little learning on, on this myself because I hadn't quite understood the full, full ramification of the classifications and other kinds of things. But, but suffice it to say, the C and the B class um, had been, the, in the book I go into the details of the process of how you end up in Yaskuni. And um, the Ministry of Health and Welfare in post-war Japan of course, was responsible for Veterans Affairs, right? So they had the list of those who served in the Imperial Army and Navy, uh, and they then handed that over to Yasukuni. Yasukuni then uh, had the ceremony that interred your spirit and soul into, uh, into the shrine. Um, this is not necessarily a Shinto ritual, it is the, just the way in which the Yasukuni shrine has operated uh, and throughout its existence last couple of hundred years. But, but the Class A's were, a problem, were problematic, I think. They had been in Koseisho, um, they had been you know, accounted for, and then they had been sent out to Yaskuni, like the C's and the B's, but they had sat in Yaskuni. And Yaskuni, the, the management of Yaskuni over the years, and I have that, a little bit of information about that in the book as well. Um, these are not Shinto priests, they're not religious, um, uh, they're not trained to be Shinto priests, they are um, you know, lay people, largely politically, political leaders, politicians. Um, so the decision to, inter to actually open the drawer and take out the list of the, class, the 14 Class A's was made by a man named Matsudaira. Uh, his father was a very influential person in the pre-war period. Uh, his father was also an attendant to the Japanese emperor. Um, he, he felt, in 1992, he wrote an article uh, in the Japanese press that outlined his thinking as to why he did it, and I quote the, the section that I thought was very the, the most clear-cut um, explanation, I quote that in the book. But basically, he came in to leave the shrine, and he made it his decision uh, to include those 14. It was done quietly, uh, because shrine activities are all done quietly, right? Uh, the Asahi Shimbu, I believe, was the first newspaper that got wind of this having been done, and it was in 1979 when they wrote about it. Um, the emperor, of course, found out, I suppose. I don't have any inside knowledge into the Japanese emperor and his, his knowledge of this, but later on, and I use this citation in the book, later on, one of his um, attendees right, uh, passed away, and in his diary, he recounted a conversation that he had had with the Showa emperor. So that's a very convoluted way of answering your question, but the, the, the Showa emperor himself refused to go uh, after the class A's were included. And in the exchange with his attendant, according to his diary, he did so because of that. What's, and he was what's very a, critical What's a class A crime? You know, what, what did it mean? Were they guilty of the Nanjing massacre? Were they guilty of... Um, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I can do justice to doing it right here, but there's a series of, there were a number of people who were identified as having led Japan into war. Um, at different categories, you have local regional commanders, for example. Not everybody was uniformed, by the way. Some of them were civilian leaders. Uh, many of them in the Class A were civilian leaders. By the end of the war, of course, they were, many of them were in uniform by that time. Um, but I don't, but you know, I would have, you'd have, we'd have to go person by person. Hideki Tojo was one of them, for example. Uh, the war minister was another one at the end of the war, right? These are not always the people, if you go back and look, who took Japan into war but they were the people at the end of the war who were responsible for prosecuting that war. Um, the B, and again, I can't go through it in detail here without you know, risking being incorrect, you know, too, I, too, um, too general about the way I, I categorize them, but these 14 individuals were the ones that the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal identified as being mostly responsible for either atrocities or for decisions yeah. that were seen as. Last Yasukuni-related question is, is why this enormous difference between the way the Germans have dealt with their kind of war crimes and the Japanese have dealt with their war crimes? You know, a, a, a grade school kid in Germany has to adopt, you know, a, a uh, somebody who perished in, in the Holocaust and kind of understand that this child died as a result of what their predecessors did. And in Japan, we see them rewriting textbooks to minimize it. I've never, what in Japan drives that? That's a huge question. I mean, it's I mean, a tough question. It's a tough question, too, because it's not, it's not what I address in the book. But I, no, no. Um, you know, people like Tom Berger up at, up at Boston University has written a whole book about this, and an excellent book, by the way. And I'm blanking on the title of it at the moment. Um, but he's written an excellent book about war, about guilt, and about the, the post-war. 
that would I would advise you to go read. Um, but I think there's also another, there's a piece of the puzzle to remember here, and that is that Japan was under U.S. occupation for seven years. The United States uh, <coughs> policy, and that's not the whole factor, but this one of the, the factors was that we changed our policy in the occupation when the Korean War broke out. It's referred to by historians as the reverse course. When the Cold War began, Japan was seen as a potential um, uh, ally of the United States, uh, also a place for the term was for Asia's arsenal, where Japan would be the locus of building uh, much of the armaments that was going to be uh, fueling the United States in the, in the region. So one factor is the Cold War, and the U.S. shift in, in the way it prosecuted the, the occupation itself. Um, I think you can read the Japanese, uh, and I can't claim to have read everybody from that period, but some of the um, people, Ashida Hitoshi, for example, they have um, diaries. <coughs> Um, of the time. He was engaged in the drafting of the Constitution, for example, with General MacArthur. Um, they saw the need to rebuild. They saw the devastation of their society. They saw the fact that millions of Japanese uh, took forever to bring home. Remember, this was a far-flung empire. We know that it's far-flung, but there were Japanese that were uh, left abroad. There were many that it took a long time to get home from the, the Russian Far East or Soviet Far East. So there was the pragmatic problem of regrouping, and that was a priority in those early years after the war was over. I don't know that we can say why didn't they adopt the laws, that the, the, you know, the anti-Nazi laws, right. or why didn't they go through that self-reflection. One of the things that I thought was very interesting, though, in writing that Yaskuni chapter is that in 2005, and 2000, 2005, when you get the last um, sort of big hurrah about whether or not Mr. Koizumi is going to go, he eventually went in 2006, right? Um, you get a real big beginning of a conversation in Japan about war memory. So, and it comes from, in some ways, it comes from the conservatives. So Watanabe Tsunio, who is the head of the Yomiuri Shinbu, right, the, the center conservative newspaper, uh, he begins this whole series in Yomiuri about war responsibility, right? When I talked to people at the time when I was there, um, very senior people, most of them conservatives, right, said to me, um, we've never had this conversation ourselves. We've only had the Americans telling us who was responsible for the war, but we've never had an internal conversation among ourselves about the judgments of who was right and who was wrong. So you could get very academic military historians talking about, well, this was tactically not right, or you, know, or you could say that going up against um, the Americans and the Dutch East Indies or going, you know, trying to cut off uh, the access to oil in the Dutch East Indies, that was tactically wrong. So you get pieces of the puzzle that were looked at, but not the wholesale review of that strategy um, for Japan. Now, today, you can go to places like Yushuka, which is the museum that probably you saw at Yaskuni, um, it, which gives a very revisionist narrative about the military causes of war. In other words, Japan was forced into war by the Western imperialists. Yep, that's what right? it says. That's the, that's the narrative. Uh, you can go and you can say that, well, some of that's actually not wrong. But the big meta-narrative, I mean, the pieces of the puzzle, right, may not be wrong, but the meta-narrative may not have been uh, right. But there's no debate over this. So you have one story here, which is we were forced into doing this. And then you have this other post-war story, which is uh, it was devastating. We lost. It was at great cost to the country. And we will not repeat it again. Um, it was a mistaken policy. So I think if you're looking for that other narrative of um, why did we commit these atrocities, why did we behave that way, why did we lose track of our military, there are some historians who work on those issues, but not a national conversation, really, uh, about blame or responsibility, either side of the picture. Imaginative solutions to this. Obviously, the history isn't great. It's a, a real irritant in the U.S.-China relationship because of our security relationship with Japan, and now the president, for the first time ever, stating that, that um, Article 5 of the Mutual Defense Treaty covers the Sinkaku, covers Japan's administration of the Sinkaku. So taking it to where we no longer, we used that, even though one would argue Secretary of State saying it is pretty definitive, yeah. But president saying it is kind of at the end of the road. So, what imaginative solutions do we have? Understanding the constraints within which the Japanese political system operates. So, 
there's several ways to think about it. And I, I did a short piece for CFR. It's a little dated now, but I did it in 2013 at the time when things were really looking like it was heading in a, a very unstable direction. I think the status quo ante, you can go back to a bilateral understanding of how this problem is going to be managed. And I think in, in many ways, um, it's not my preference, but it is one option that I think there's a lot of experience with in many ways among the bureaucrats, the politicians, right? Japan and China have done this before, right? Um, you can look at 2010 and you can look at 2012 and say, oh, it's all changed, it's all different. But the reality is it's not all changed, it's not all different. You can choose to go back to a bilateral framework for managing this problem. And I think that's one that should be seriously considered. I, I thought it was interesting in the meeting before Abe and Xi at the, at the APEC, and I, I understand that the English version, the Chinese version, the Japanese version were slightly All different. different. <laughs> but I don't think they were, di the language was slightly different, but they were not necessarily different in intent, in, in terms of being able to establish some framework by which that meeting could go forward. And I think the one important piece is, obviously there was the, of the four items, there was the piece about history that is clearly there and that is a reference to the sensitivities that Japan needs to be aware of. But the other was there was a recognition that risk reduction was a common interest of the Japanese and Chinese. In other words, nobody benefited by an unstable situation around these islands. That in fact said to me, obviously, that despite the kind of different political leanings of Japanese on this issue, or Chinese for that matter, um, nobody wants to go to war, right? So the minute you have a recognition that we have risk involved in the way we're managing this problem, we have to find an alternative. That acknowledgement in and of itself, I thought was a very important piece of the building of that creative solution, right? In 1978, when the treaty was concluded, it wasn't risk that drove them to say, you know, we'll find a, man a management strategy. It was really the larger Japan-China relationship was more important. Well, now the sovereignty issue is popularly of great interest to both peoples of both countries. There is risk inherent here that I think we should, cannot be ignored. And I think it would, until we get to a very different place in this bilateral relationship, that risk is not going to go away. So I think it was very smart, frankly, to say that's what we ought to focus on and that's what we ought to build on. Beyond that, you know, I think uh, this is a different chapter in the book, but it's the chapter on the maritime boundary. Right. Um, but UNCLOS is beginning to sort of, it's not necessarily that UNCLOS is a bad thing, so please don't misunderstand me, but it is a new and emerging maritime regime. It is not complete in the sense that it has dispute resolution mechanisms in place yet, right? And there's a lot of latitude for different interpretation, different participation. The United States hasn't ratified UNCLOS, by the way, which I think we ought to do if we're going to talk about the norms and laws and frameworks of, of peace and prosperity. So that's my little footnote peeve, obviously. Um, but, but therein lies some, some work that also needs to be done, is that UNCLOS itself may not have been the culprit in the maritime boundary dispute between the two countries, but the two countries do interpret that median, the, not the median line, but that where that boundary actually exists very differently. It has tremendous resource implications. So in 2008, when Fudan Hu managed to say joint energy development is the way we will work through those differences, that's another piece of the puzzle, right? right? So I think a creative solution is not, this is where the islands are gonna be, and this is who's going to own them, and this is, you know. Um, but I think you have to think about the component pieces, and I, those three component pieces are very critical. So bilateral management, or agreement on management, however it ends up being managed, right? Risk reduction and then some kind of accommodation of the joint energy needs and technologies and opportunities, I think, between the two countries. Th that's the three-pronged approach that I would suggest will get you a little bit better, get the territorial issue back into the place in the relationship it ought to be, which is, we disagree, but nobody lives on those islands. Is there much energy, strategically, they're meaningless? No. Strategically, in, in today's world, they're meaningless. In the 19th and 18th century, they may have had a little bit of interest. Right. Let me see if I can come back to the right. But is there much energy? I'm going the wrong way. Um, well, in here lies the which... question. So there you have, that's the top, that's, that, that's the underwater map, right? Um, which is most important. The, the, the coordinates around the continental shelf, which you see that first ridge where I put out Senkaku, right? Diaoyu writing it from a different perspective, but... Um, <laughs> we won't show that to the Chinese. We won't show it to the Chinese, but please forgive me. Um, but on the edge of that there, you, you look at the, you're looking at the continental shelf.
and the Chinese position on the median, the how to work through the EEZ boundary demarcation in the East China Sea is based on uh, the continental shelf, right? There are other countries around the world that also base the, their EEZ claims based on the continental shelf, by the way. Um, won't name them now. <laughs> but so China, China's not alone in this. But clearly that's the foundational point under UNCLOS of where they want to locate their maritime boundary with Japan. Um, under UNCLOS you can have 200 nautical miles and then an extended 150 if you are claiming off of a continental shelf. So you get a bigger EEZ. In other words, the continental shelf gives you access to the seabed resources on your shelf, right? Um, the, the Okinawa trough right there is thousands of meters deep, and then you get the, obviously, that volcanic ridge that you know, pop, pops up in the form of the Okinawa Bonin, Yuki Bonin Islands, right? Um, the cooperation between the two, the two countries, there you go, it's a little bit small, so I apologize. I'm using the map from my book. Um, let me just stand up and point if you don't mind, Steve, because it might be easier for my mind. Okay. So the, what people don't understand about the 2008 agreement on the joint energy development, so there's been a lot of joint energy. The South Koreans and the Japanese over here, right? Um, they really didn't come up with anything that's really commercially viable, right? The other is the, the, the Shirakaba or the Chenshao, right? So means there's gas fields. This, this, this is the median line that the Japanese claim ought to be the boundary. This is the continental shelf, right? Roughly. Um, but the gas fields, there's, there's drilling on both sides, right? But there's claims to wells on both sides, but really the Chinese are developing the gas field here, right? But the spot, the second, there was a second spot in that 2008 agreement, and that spot's up here. It's deeper water, has not been explored, relies on much more advanced technology, and it hasn't been ascertained yet whether or not there are seabed deep bed resources there. But both sides think and hope there might be. Right? And there may, there, there's much more commercial interest by the Japanese oil and gas industry in that part of, of, of the joint exploration. But this is about nationalism, not about resources. Right. Yeah. I mean, it can be dressed up as resources, right? But, but the, that's not what drove what But that's not what's driving this. No. Yeah. No. It's so interesting that Uniclos, which was intended to make things better, both in fact, here right. and in the case of the South China yeah. Sea, has made it worse. Yeah. It was the yeah. memorialization of the claims that has created tension in the South yeah. China Sea. And when you date a lot of the disputes <laughs> there, it's yeah. from when Uniclos yeah. required that they be filed. It's, it's so, no so good deed goes unpunished. Right. So it's a, it's a wonderful maritime regime where none existed, right? It, it, it raises all kinds of clarifications on resources and, and, and um, how to think about scientifically, how to think about the maritime commons, but it's an incomplete regime, right? So it's incomplete on what happens if you don't agree in other words, if you don't have that 400 nautical miles between you, the only rep recipe is to negotiate. There is no other mechanism under UNCLOS by which you can, can do it. So you have this scientific battle over whether the continental shelf is the right place to start or you know, deep sea is the right place to start. So you, you interpret. You don't have a body that has the authority to enforce an interpretation of scientific data. You have a survey committee of scientists, right? right? But no enforcement mechanism, no authority to make the decision, right? Um, now, we may not want those, but I think we ought to recognize that UNCLOS has been one of the one of the drivers in some of this competition when it comes to maritime boundaries. And I assume there will the Japanese at some point in the future recognize that there's a dispute in order to kind of be able to over the islands. Yes. No, I don't think so. In order to in, in order to put the dispute behind them. Let me be less categorical about that. I'll, I'll let back up the tape for a second. Let's <laughs> reverse. Um, you could see in the diplomatic language that the Japanese government has used in the past with China, especially when the joint energy development uh, deal was being created, was being discussed in the 2003-2005 period, right? You could see that there was an acknowledgement of a difference, difference of interest, a different interpretation. You could see that. Now, whether the Japanese government, <laughs> excuse me, will say, we have a sovereignty dispute with China, I don't think so. So I think it's like, I don't think you're going to hear a Korean government official ever say, we have a sovereignty dispute over Dokdo. They don't, those are ours. <laughs> China may have a claim, or Taiwan may have a claim, or Japan may have a claim. That, that, that's just the language of those sovereignty disputes. But I think the recognition that that doesn't need to get in the way of the bigger purpose of resource development uh, energy development, that we don't have to, we may have different approaches to UNCLOS, 
but we can still find ways of, of, of sharing interests and finding a common solution, right? Let me open the floor to a couple of questions, and um, you know, we'll Max back. Hi, uh, Hi. Nice to meet you here. So my name is Max Kwok. Uh, I have a friend uh, who's Japanese who served in the U.S. Navy. He told me that the the, the Japanese nationalists actually, you know, had this consensus about uh, the Yasukuni Shrine being uh, the Japanese version of the Arlington uh, National Cemetery. So I was wondering. In your opinion, like what can the what can Japanese government do so that it's not or it is a comparable to the center? And then my second question is no, only one question oh, because we have very little. Very I can't little remember time. two. <laughs> yeah. I'm a little fuzzy after my plane. <laughs> very quick question: Is it the same as Arlington? I think I would not put nationalists in the front of that statement. I think there are actually quite a few Japanese. Uh, you, you can find diplomats and others who say, well, it, how is it different from Arlington? Every, every country has a place where it memorializes or commemorates the sac sacrifice of its veterans, right? Um, which is true. But again, in, the, in that chapter of my book, I go through all of the different ways in which Yasukuni has been a problem in the past or has been defined to be an inappropriate place, both occupation authorities, inside Japanese politics itself. There are people who have very different opinions on this, right? And then the largest constituency of Yasukuni, of course, is the veterans' families. No, nobody wants to honor war veterans in any country more than the people who lost their brothers or fathers or grandfathers to war, right? So the veterans' families have been a very critical component of the advocacy of Yasukuni uh, through the years. However, and I, it's, it's in that chapter in the book, when you, mid-2000s, the period I was looking at with Koizumi, right, um, is you begin to see some differences of opinion among the, the bereaved, they call them the bereaved veterans association, the bereaved families association. They begin, there, there's a lot of different opinion inside that group. And many of them want the emperor to go back. They don't care about a politician going to the shrine. In the, the way in which their, their fathers or their brothers, whoever went, went to war, they feel that it's the Japanese emperor, actually, that should go and thank them for their sacrifice. So the, pol the politicization by these prime ministers Right, actually gets in the way of that. So again, even in, among the families themselves, you have some very different opinions, and I go through that in the book um, in quite detail. I think on our side, the Obama administration at least has sought to identify Ch Chidori Gafuji, which is a little bit like the tomb of the, for, uh, of the forgotten, the unknown soldier in Arlington. Mm -hmm. So Chidori Gafuji was built because they couldn't identify the remains. There were remains from veterans that were brought back home, but they couldn't be identified. So that cemetery was built specifically for those people. Uh, Prime Minister Abe himself went there uh, last August, right? So Chidori Fuji is one option. Uh, I discussed with former cabinet secretary and then Prime Minister of Fukuda, Yasuo. Uh, while Koizumi was prime minister, he had a whole committee look at this question of, if not Yasukuri, then where? And there is a whole proposal for an alternative, uh, alternative secular memorial. The government itself has a ceremony every year, not at Yasukuri, and the emperor and empress still go to that. Right? Uh, and the veterans come, the family's members come, and that's held in a large part of the area. So there's a lot of ideas about commemoration. Um, not all of them are focused on Yasukuni, so thank you. Oh, Jane? Well, okay. we'll give others. Okay, and then Jane. Um, yeah, Sheila, I'm just curious, particularly in light of Steve's comment, how you interpret Abe's visit and the speech to Congress? How you interpret How I interpret Abe's, Abe's, uh, Prime Minister Abe's speech to Congress? Um, well, you know, being inside, in, in Washington, of course, there was a lot of sensitivity and lots of, I had lots of governments who came to talk to me about what he might or might not say. And so uh, I'm not sure that my views on this subject are, are, are divorced from that positioning of what, what did he need to say and what should he say. And of course, the South Korean government and press was very concerned about whether or not he would apologize for the war. Um, I, I should say that I didn't get any visits from the Chinese government. They were, they were very polite. Um, <laughs> no advocacy. Um, but I think, to be honest, the more, I, the more I thought about it myself was that I didn't see that it would do Japan, South Korea any good to try to conduct their diplomacy through that congressional speech, right? And there have been, in the last six months or so, in that, that bilateral, there have been some, there's some indications of movement, right? President Park, of course, made her statement after the Abe visit. She's coming in June. She will have her own chance to, to speak. 
and to talk about um, the post-war settlement in Asia. So I think what, what I thought, by, as we got closer and closer to the visit, I thought, well, the Abe statement in, in August will deal with questions of Murayama and Kono and language, right? That's obviously where that's going to happen. I don't know that our Congress is involved, interested, wants to digest that, or would necessarily even understand it with the with the kind of nuance that we're talking about here, right? And I, I don't I mean that with no insult, insult to our Congress, it's just not what they're thinking about, right? Um, so I thought he did a great, I thought he talked to our veterans, right? And then he, he I, when I was, I was in, in the gallery and I was listening, not reading his speech. Um, and then he went from our veterans, the American souls, into the remorse over Asia. And I thought obviously he had amplified the repentance to the American souls. And I thought he could very easily have inserted a sentence <laughs> in transition. And that was my very kind of, hmm. And then when I read the speech, I felt a little bit less strongly about that. But I think, you know, I'm not a speech writer, but it would have been, it would have been a, a, an interesting way of handling it. All told, though, honestly, I, don't, I didn't think he was going to use that occasion, right? I think he is going to, in August, make a statement that will speak to the, the not only to Japan's neighbors, but also to the debate inside Japan. Um, and so I think... Where will that be made? Well, it, he, it's the 70th anniversary speech. It will be on August 15th. I don't know if it's going to be an actual speech or it will be a written document. Um, Murayama in 1995 has used, used the most forward-leaning language. Talks about a mistaken policy. Talks about colonial, um, the, the colonial rule and, um, I forget, the, it uses the word aggression. There's one other reference there in terms of behavior in China. Um, but there's code words in the Murayama statement now that, that people are looking to Abe's statement to repeat or to assert. Um, and I think that's that the, the semantics will become very important at that time. Do you think he will? He will he go as far as or even further than Murayama? He will not be further than Murayama. No, I don't think so. But if you, in that, when, you when he became prime minister in 2006, we had this conversation back then too about how his personal views might influence his, his thinking about Japan's national policy. And he clearly reiterated as national policy the 2005 Murayama statement. He did the same when he came back again in 2012. So on, he also stood next to the president, which is the one piece that, not the congressional speech, but the, the bilateral with the president, he stood next to the president and said that he, he would uphold the Kono statement and would not revise it, which was a very strong statement. He had never made as un unequivocal a statement in English, right? He had at one point inside, Jap inside Tokyo in Japanese. Um, so I'm parsing a little bit, but just so the code words are clear, he did what people wanted him to do in South Korea, very explicitly on the Kono statement. Uh, and I think we'll have to wait to see what the obvious statement says. One, I don't think it's going to be much different. Okay, one last question. Rob Shu with the Voice of America. Hi. Sure, can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the Japanese effort to rewriting um, the Article 9? Uh, sure. And uh, what, if it's, it's done, what, what's the possible impact on the uh, relations between Japan and China? So I'm, 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 I'm quickly diving into my next book, which <laughs> has me looking a little bit at the constitutional issue, but also um, the, the way in which the, use of the question of use of force has evolved in the last, especially since the end of the Cold War um, by Japan. So last summer, on, in July 1st, uh, Prime Minister Abe announced that he would reinterpret a past uh, interpretation of the restriction on the right to collective self-defense. So he has now, um, you'll watch in Parliament in the next couple of months, there's about 10 to 12 bills, maybe 14, uh, I've lost track, um, that are going to be amended based on this reinterpretation of the Constitution. Uh, it allows um, Japan's self-defense forces to work alongside other national militaries, including the United States, first and foremost, but also in PKO activities, things that they've been doing already, but they will be able to do them in a much more forthright manner, uh, not combat, right? Um, and also potentially to work with Australia uh, and other partners in the Asia Pacific. Largely, the missions that are be under consideration are missions the self-defense force has already been engaged in. So there's no new military activities that are really going to come out of this. Um, they've been, you may know, they've been doing mine sweeping in the Gulf of Aden, right? So there's been a lot of learning by the self-defense forces over the last decade and a half uh, because they've had much more international collaboration with other militaries, right? So that's going to be reflected in these bills. 
the bigger picture is really this question of revising the Constitution itself. And Mr. Abe is a proponent of revising the Japanese Constitution, not, not just Article 9. Um, but if you look in the diet debate of the last, I don't know, six months or so, there's been a growing conversation in the diet about if we revise it, how? If we revise it, why? Where will we focus? And the Prime Minister has begun to use the word amend. So I suspect it's not going to be what we imagined in the past, a wholesale revision of the document. But it may be uh, amendments, much like the American amendments, right? In which the Japanese themselves create amendments on the environment, per perhaps, or on privacy, uh, 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 privacy issues, things that are very contemporary modern, right? I think that's where that conversation will lead. The political calculus is that next summer is an upper house election in 2016. Uh, the lower house, Mr. Abe and his uh, coalition partner, Kome, already have a supermajority to pass legislation. To revise the Constitution, you need a two-thirds majority in both houses that wants to do that. And then you need an agreement in both of those houses over what to revise. Right? So it's not just that the ruling party can say what it wants to revise. You have to have a two-thirds majority consensus on what to revise. They will then put forward the language that they want to put or to the Japanese people under a national referendum for approval. So that's under Article 96 of the Constitution, that's the way in which revision takes place, amendment takes place. Um, so we'll be able to see it unfold. I do not think that Article 9 is going to be the first thing that gets tackled. I think you're more liable to see something on, the envir on environmental protections, perhaps, or on privacy protections. You'll see something that's a much more modern contemporary issue where there is cross-party agreement. Uh, and even if you look at the LDP's draft, they have a draft as a party uh, of revision, they don't really fundamentally change Article 9. So the part that we know of as it references back to the kellogg Beyond Pact, right, we will not use force to settle international disputes, that remains even in the LDP's draft. They get, they get rid of the word self-defense force, and they call it a national defense army or military, um, but they don't have an Article 9 that looks dramatically different, right? or gets rid of that restriction that was not restriction, but that first paragraph and the spirit of that first paragraph. Sheila, I want to thank you so much. This is this is one of <laughs>